have one fantastic lecturer who's joining us now for the next two weeks. He's got two legs with us. Very fortunate to have this man on board. He's travelled to 120 countries. He's done 20 years of lecturing here on Seabourn. He said this is his 91st cruise. He's a wonderful gentleman and we're very honoured to have him here. He's going to talk a little bit about himself and, of course, tonight's lecture. With So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to introduce the wonderful Brian Ford. Thank you. Well, no, I'm not going to bore you with telling you something about myself. Well, I'll tell you a bit. I'm here. I'm relatively sober. I'm accompanied by my dear wife, Jan which means that I shall probably always be on time, properly dressed, and with my trousers zipped up. <laughs> Other than that, you don't need to know anything, except where are we going? And I thought to myself, well, I'm a scientist. I've done a lot of work in so many fields. And I thought it would be interesting to look at just where we think the med came from. I mean, this is it. Turn open a book, and this is what you'll find. And where did we begin? Well, everybody will tell you, of course. We began with the Big Bang. And everybody celebrates the Big Bang. Curiously, the Big Bang, I think the phrase was coined by Fred Hoyle, whom I knew years ago. And it was coined as a joke, not meant to be taken seriously. And in fact, in recent years, the notion of a Big Bang has almost come into disfavor in some quarters. You will see here, uh, I'll be lunching at Cambridge and lurking behind his... Uh, inimitable computer screen, you will see my late and much missed chum, Stephen Hawking. And Stephen actually said to me in, in his later years that he was beginning to doubt the Big Bang. I find the Big Bang interesting. I'm just a simple-minded biologist. And if somebody says to me that the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago, I want to say, well, what was there 13.9 billion years ago? It's got to come from somewhere. And what I would always find interesting is this. If you put a sort of a simplified account of the Big Bang alongside a simplified account of the book of Genesis, the two of them look terribly similar. And I can't help thinking that many of these scholars were influenced subconsciously through a religious upbringing and just found themselves interpreting the origin of the universe in terms of what they'd learnt as little kids. To me... The whole point of the universe is that it's always been here and always will. It's the only eternal thing that we know. It's perpetually changing and undergoing turbulent alterations as time goes by. But for me, the, the, the infinite endurance of the universe is what makes it special. And I can't see why anybody ever had to assume that it had a single beginning. The argument for it is th this Doppler redshift of light. And I had urgent discussions with Martin Rees, Lord Rees, the Astronomer Royal. And I remember saying to Martin on one occasion, well, you insist that the light from distant stars is red because it's travelled such a long way. If I travel a long way, I tend to get red. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that it must all once have started in a club, couldn't it be that light gets a bit on the red side when it travels a long way? And I've still not had a simple answer to that. So although the Big Bang is something convenient to talk about, and it does underpin modern astronomy, you don't have to assume that it must be true. The sights that we see are extraordinary. Here are the pillars and jets in the uh, Carina nebula, not photographed, as you might think, with this uh, new Webb telescope. That was a picture taken 13 years ago by the Hubble. You do know, don't you, that when the Hubble was launched, they found they couldn't focus it because somebody had mistaken millimetres for inches when they were building part of it, and they had to send up a crew to go and fix it. I always thought that was a wonderful story. And how about this? Here is a picture looking far into space. These are all nebulae, each containing millions of stars around which there may be planets that nobody has ever thought of detecting. That was also taken by the Hubble. And then when this picture came out, taken with the newer Webb telescope, 
astronomers said, this is the most important picture ever made in the history of astronomy. And I thought, no, it's not. It's just more bloody nebulae. Wherever you look into the depths of space, all you see is nebulae. And then I began to realize an appalling truth that I hate even to share with you this evening. And that is that astronomers, well, they're not liars exactly, but they are incredible exaggerators. In order to get people to give them vast grants and huge sums of money, they will invent the most extraordinary stories. Look at this, for instance. Here is a list of potential exoplanets, potentially habitable exoplanets, planets outside our solar system where people could live. There's a whole list of them, beautiful little pictures. Every single one is imaginary. Astronomers think they may have detected the presence of exoplanets. Originally, it was done by, by studying the brightness from a distant star. And at regular intervals, they'd notice that the brightness dipped down a little bit and then went up again, as though there was something orbiting it. And when it went in front, it would cut down the brightness of the star. And they thought, oh, there must be a planet. So instead of just honestly saying, we think we have evidence that there might be a planet out there somewhere, they got artists to draw pictures of it when they hadn't even seen the body. I mean, I cannot tell you how irritated I am by the fact that pictures like this appear in magazines as though they were reality, when in fact they're fairy stories, they're mermaids, they're unicorns. I was sitting next to a, an engineer on a plane to Los Angeles some years ago, and he opened a magazine, something like National Geographic or whatever, some of these pictures, and he said, my God, he said, I bet you wish you were an astronomer, not a biologist. I mean, these wonderful new worlds. I said, they're all invented. He said, no, not, they've got pictures of them. Look, these are photographs. I said, no, they're not photographs. They're what we euphemistically call an artist's impression. So although these things have appeared widely, not one of them is an actual drawing of anything real. The only thing we do know that's real is our nebula. This is the Andromeda Nebula, which is 2.53 million light years away. Light from it takes 2.53 million years. Light gets from us, from them, to us in that length of time. Can you imagine how far away that is? However, we think that our galaxy is pretty much like this, and our sun is pretty near the edge, and a small star of no great importance, just an average star. In terms of size, this is how big the planets are. There is the sun, and there are the planets. And look how insignificant and tiny Earth is. So far as astronomy is concerned, so far as the universe is concerned, so far as the whole panoply of existence is concerned, we are a total irrelevance. We could disappear tomorrow and nobody would notice. Well, that's not quite true. They would realize that transmissions of the archers had suddenly stopped. But other than that, they would have no means at all of knowing that we had actually disappeared. And so we live on this little blue pearly blob in the outer recesses of space of no importance to anybody but ourselves. We appear blue because the air is blue. It's the oxygen in the air which gives it that sort of blue tinge. And if you fit together a lot of satellite photographs and clean them up a bit, this is what you get. And that is our home. 92.7 million miles away from the sun on average. And curiously, 24,000 miles around the equator. So if you live on the equator, you're actually traveling around at exactly 1,000 miles an hour. And what we have done is to map the continents and give names to countries. And that's what you have. Now, when I was a little boy, I was about nine at school in North London. And I remember looking at the map and I thought, you know, this is amazing. I thought, if you look at the coasts of the two major continental masses, they almost look as though they fitted together like a jigsaw. I wonder if they were joined up once. Well, it would be nice to think that was a, an original thought. 
But just how late in the day that thought was, I shall now show you. Because Alfred Wegener is the man whom we celebrate for creating the notion of what we now call continental drift. He wrote this letter to his wife, saying, doesn't it look as though the east coast of South America fits into the west coast of Africa? This is an idea, he said, I will have to pursue. And Wegener has gone down in history as the man who came up with the notion of continental drift. Well, that was a hundred years ago, and I hate to say it, but we can go back a lot further than that. Here is Frank Bursley Taylor from Harvard. He went to the University of Harvard and then dropped out and joined the US Geological Survey in 1900. And he also wrote, didn't it look as though the two had fitted together? We can go back further than that. I traced it back to William Henry Pickering. And he also thought that continental drift had occurred. We can go back further than that. How about this? Alfred Was Russell Wallace, the man who came up with the theory of evolution later perpetrated by Charles Darwin. Uh, you may know this, that, that Alfred Russell Wallace wrote an account of evolution by survival of the fittest. And he sent it to Darwin, who was a very well-known naturalist, and said, I wonder what you think about this. Should I publish it? And Darwin started saying to his friends, well, I was thinking of publishing this too. So I'm going to write my book quick. And when the theory was presented at the Linnaean Society, I happened to be an honorary fellow of the Linnaean Society in London, and when the theory was presented, it was presented by a fellow, not by either of them, but it was a paper presented jointly by Darwin and Wallace. And it was known as a joint theory for years. Only later, Charles Darwin, who was probably as great a wheeler dealer as the astronomers I mentioned earlier, managed to claim credit for it himself. But in fact, there were at least ten philosophers who come up with the idea of survival of the fittest before either of them. Anyway, let's come back and go still further. And here we go back to Vienna and Edward Seuss. He is the man who came up with the idea of Gondwana land, one major continent. And he was quite convinced that the continents had split. What about Sir Charles Lyell? He goes back even further. And he was quite convinced that there had been geological epochs which had resulted in the separation of the continents. Until you come to the work of a chap in France called Pellegrini. Antonio Sneer Pellegrini. He, interestingly enough, published a perfect theory exactly like the theory that Wegener became so famous for. Published it in the 1860s. And just look at this. This is the diagram that he published. There you are. There are the continents together. And there they are torn apart. That's the theory of continental drift, published by a Frenchman that almost everybody has forgotten about. But he wasn't the first either. Sir Francis Bacon. He also thought that uh, those great continents of South America and Africa had been torn apart. And he published it too. It's an extraordinary thought. The portrait of him was painted in 1731, a sort of retrospective portrait until we get right back to Amsterdam in the 1500s. And would you believe it, even then, people were speculating that the continents had torn apart. So, of course, my childish little idea was totally unoriginal and pointless. And even Wegener's was, in many ways, superseded by people centuries and centuries before. The first time it ever came up was actually in the 1500s and not the 1900s at all. And when you look back at the earlier accounts, you see these extraordinarily interesting early maps that showed the extent of our knowledge at any one time. And this is the Theatre of the Globe, as it was called, published in 1579. That's as far as people had gone in discovering. They'd done quite well, hadn't they, half a millennium ago. But let's come back to Wegener. He's the person who undertook to popularize the view. The other writers had just thought it was a fairly obvious conclusion. But it was Wegener who decided 
this was an important theory and he was going to promote it. And so he gave a number of lectures. It was first proposed in 1912, but he traveled the world and he gave several lectures. He was widely invited to the United States to lecture, not as you might think, as a distinguished philosopher and an important person. He was invited to be ridiculed. And astonishing as it may seem, there were scholars in the United States who still didn't accept continental drift, even around 1970, as recently as that. And you can't blame them. I mean, the attitude was, you know, I'm still on the world, it's made of rock. Can't possibly move. But of course, over the aeons of time, it can. And yet, Paul Wegener was ridiculed wherever he went. He proposed this grand vision, and the president of the American Philosophical Society said it was utter damned rot. Now, a hundred years ago, that word was as, as strong as a four-letter word would be today. I mean, even in modern lyrics, we tend to find a euphemism for the word like damned. We say darned or danged or something of the sort. Imagine that. The president of the American Philosophical Society using words like that. You can see the utter contempt with which 20th century scientists held the view in the first few decades. And in the United States, well past the midpoint of the century. Wegener loved the Arctic. He was actually a meteorologist, not a geologist. And he loved exploring the Arctic. And he was last seen with his team of 21 technicians, 71 degrees north, where he perished in a storm. His body was found many years later. But he was dead in 1930. And during that decade, scientists began to look more closely. And they realized that if you look at, at the strata of the Americas and the strata of Africa, that they're actually all in the same sequence. And if you look for fossils, you would find that the fossils at the same level were much the same on both sides of the Atlantic. So the notion began to become increasingly widely accepted. And then we had this group of British geophysicists. And they actually put together the geological evidence and drew up for the first time, not just an idea, not just a passing thought or a whimsy, but an actual serious proposal of what we now call plate tectonics. Of course, for years, it was called continental drift. And science doesn't like a term like continental drift because anybody can understand it. <laughs> now, the whole point of science is to confuse the public. We always believe that scientists use long terms in order to communicate, but that's not true. They use long terms to confuse outsiders. I've done a lot of research on blood coagulation, for example, and in the lab we work with red cells, we count red cells, we observe red cells, we quantify red cells, we calculate red cells. If a visitor comes in, somebody's armed, or somebody from the grants committee, then those red cells suddenly become erythrocytes, which means red cells, but in Greek. So we now say, yes, we're studying erythrocytes, and we're counting erythrocytes. And as soon as a stranger's gone, they go back to being red cells again. No, the long words of science are used not to communicate, but to excommunicate. And continental drift was never liked because any fool could understand what it meant. Plate tectonics, that's science for you. Now, since the era of satellites, we've been able to do all sorts of measurements. And since we've learned how to probe the depths of the ocean, we've discovered extraordinary truths about geology. On the left is a map showing the outlines of the tectonic plates, the cracks in the Earth's crust. And on the right, the dark areas show the youngest rocks in the world, and the pale areas show the older rocks. So as you can see, the rocks down the middle of the Atlantic are brand new. That's because they're rising up and spreading out, and they're doing it today. You go to Iceland, 
And you can actually stand with one foot on either side of that divide. And in the years that Jan and I have been to Iceland, we have seen places where a small gap is now much bigger. If ever you can go to Tingvashir in, in Iceland, you will see it for yourselves with your own eyes. And in fact, America and Europe are still moving apart. Interestingly enough, the speed at which they're separating is exactly the same as the speed at which your toenails grow. So the next time you snip two or three millimeters from your toenails, just look at it before you discard it and think, that is how much further America has moved away from Europe. No wonder airfares are going up. So it is a remarkable fact that these plates are still drifting around. And if we look back, let's go back a couple of hundred million years, and let us see how, as time has gone by, we now think that the continental masses may have shifted. This, we think, is the world of the distant past. By a hundred million years ago, you had Asia, and you had North America, and South America and Africa are just beginning to split. And do you see that little triangle down on the bottom right? That's going to be India. And it begins to move at increasing speed, shooting up at several millimeters a year, which, if you're a continent, is a real record run, until it crashes into the southern Asiatic plate. And of course, whenever there's a crash, you have a crumble zone, and that's the Himalayas. In the same way, you had the Pacific plate moving in towards South America, and when the two crashed, you had the Andes. The same for the Rocky Mountains. And so the modern world that we have is actually the result of all of these incessantly moving plates. And quite interestingly enough, if you plot where all the great earthquakes have been over the last few decades, they begin to form a pattern. And if you then overlay the borders of those tectonic plates, you can quite clearly see, can't you, that most of the earthquakes have happened along them. Do you see that little knot to the right of the Mediterranean? No wonder there have just been three, six plus earthquakes in Afghanistan. It's an extraordinarily destructive force but it's a force that's with us every day. And so there it is, our little blue planet. And that's where we live. It's quite remarkable to think of what has happened in the past. And the way in which humans have come to occupy it is extraordinary. We seem to have originally emerged in Africa and slowly spread across Africa and then up, mostly via the coast, across Europe and Asia, across the land bridge to what is now Alaska, because of course it was dry land at the time, and eventually right down to the south of South America. And we can find some evidence of the earliest human settlements and populations. I mean, look at that, 17,000 years ago. This is at Altamira in northern Spain, a half hour drive from Santander, and it's such a beautiful painting. That is art. It's representational art. If you think of the way in which we used to paint people in the 14 and 1500s, and our art wasn't nearly as good as their conventions then. Look at that. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? The caves of Lascaux. That they have stopped people going to Altamira and Lascaux because of the fact that the CO2 and exhalations and the moisture with actually damaging the ancient pigments. So they've now created equivalent caves where you can still walk through, but they're all modern creations of the old thing. You simply can't allow people to go in anymore. The, these paintings are so precious and they have to be preserved. So here's the Mediterranean, Medi, middle, Terra, Earth, the middle of the Earth, the Mediterranean and the surrounding lands as envisaged by Ptolemy in the second century. This was actually a drawing done in 1426. It's now at Ulm Cathedral in Germany. 
And if you look just at the Mediterranean, you will see there are names there we can recognize. We have just sailed away from Iberia. And there is the Iberian Peninsula. We've been to the Balearic Islands, and that's also recognized too. We're going up to Gaul, Gallia, to France. And we're going to end up, of course, in Italia, in Italy. So some of the names on that map, drawn all those centuries ago, we can still recognize today. And those are the countries as we now understand them. And there are national boundaries. Of course, national boundaries are often quite wrong. If you look at the, the map of Africa, you'll see that an awful lot of the, the international boundaries of countries are horizontal or vertical, because, of course, they were drawn by British surveyors who would say that the boundary is going to be along this line of latitude or longitude. And of course, the local tribes people and the communities that lived there, they paid no heed to boundaries. In fact, in many cases, we have forced communities with disparate uh, uh, social and cultural conventions to live together when they didn't really want to. But some of the ancient remains that we have around the Med take us back to the dawn of civilization. This is 4,000 years old. This is at Knossos on Crete. And this extraordinary civilization, which left us these amazing relics, disappeared, was wiped out. We have some of the traces which nobody has yet interpreted. People have been working, scholars have worked on these early alphabets of the Minoan language and have failed to interpret them to this day. Well, right back, way, way back, a couple of hundred years BC, and this is the way in which the tribes around the Mediterranean looked. They were, of course, essentially Bronze Age and early Iron Age people. And in fact, we have managed to interpret some of the very earliest writings. This is a knit comb to get rid of head lice. It's 3,700 years old. And it's written in the Canaanite language. And it actually says, may this tusk root out the hair and the beard to be free of lice. That's some of the oldest writing anybody has managed to interpret. This is an inscription in Linear B, a language that preceded Greek. And we can understand Linear B. You can read the documents perfectly clearly. That dates back 3,200 years. And brings us, of course, to that great empire, the greatest empire of the early world when Greece ruled. You know, when you go and look at something like the Acropolis, for instance, and... and, and you look at it, you, you see that the way that the pillars are built, they're slightly bulging in the middle, then tapering, so that to the naked eye they look straight. The floor very gently rises into the middle and then slightly goes down at the end. And it isn't an exact rectangle. In fact, scholars have said there isn't a single straight line anywhere in it. They understood so much about the way in which architecture had to be constructed in order to look the way the architect wanted to the eyes of the beholder. Then, of course, the Greeks colonized all around the Mediterranean and all around the Iberian Peninsula and left an incredible legacy. Have you noticed that quite a number of letters in Greek are the same as they are in the Latin alphabet, our English alphabet? And quite a few more are shared by the Cyrillic alphabet. And actually, you can plot them out. And there on the top left are letters only in Latin, on the top right, only in Greek, and on the bottom, only in Russian. The ones in the central triangle are common to all languages, and you can see the letters that are shared. So those languages had a common origin, and since became disparate and slowly changed. But you can trace their family relationships to this day. It is amazing to look at the whole history of imperial Rome. That's the Holy Roman Empire at its most. Right up to Hadrian's Wall 
where they built a wall. We've been along it ourselves. They built a wall with forts all the way along to keep those horrendous Scots out. In the long term, that didn't work. But right the way around the Med and all the way across North Africa, the Romans ruled. You can go to Tunisia and see a wonderful amphitheatre, almost as big as the Colosseum, all over those, those worlds. Places that people hardly ever go to visit. And Rome created structures that are here to this day. I mean, look at that in Segovia, in central Spain. That was built nearly 2,000 years ago by the Romans. And just look at it. Its grace, its solidity, its architectural and mathematical perfection. Can you imagine anything better than that? You'd think that was a recent construction, possibly Victorian. No, no. That's almost 2,000 years ago. And when the Romans went, the Muslims came. So many of the things that we have in Europe derive from the Muslim occupation. We don't like to admit it. When you're in school, you're told very little about Arab civilization. And we have terms, we call them the Moors or the Saracens, all these different words. No, they were the Muslim Arabs. And they conquered the whole of the Med, the whole of the Middle East, where, of course, they still rule, and also the whole of Spain. The Arabs ruled Spain for almost a thousand years. Most people never thought about it. And if they are, you get the impression they were there for a couple of centuries. No, almost a thousand years they were in Spain. 4,000 words of the Spanish language are, in fact, Arabic. Many in English. Algebra is Arabic. Alcohol, zero. Sugar, alchemy. All Arabic words to this day. And the Arabs actually brought much of the teaching of the ancient world into Europe. It was the philosophers from the Muslim world, from, from Arabia and from Persia, who did that. And they were extraordinary conquerors. This is a picture of the Battle of Poitiers. The Arabs got within 200 miles of Paris in the year 732 when they were beaten back. Isn't that an extraordinary thought? This is a painting by Steuben in 1837. But can you imagine that, that the Arab world within 200 kilometers of Paris? And when you look back at some of these early Muslim philosophers, here is a Caesarean section being carried out a thousand years ago, portrayed by a Persian physician. And with this study, of the phases of the moon, all worked out mathematically, also about a thousand years ago, by uh, Al Biruni, a Persian scholar. And when you go and see the architecture, go to Cordova, Arabic word, in Spain, and you'll find these beautiful Arabic arches built about 785. The Alhambra. If you read about the Alhambra the tourist magazines and they'll say, yes, there's quite a lot of evidence of Arabic script. No, no, it's an Arabic temple. The fountains in it are fed from streams in the mountains where the hydrologers worked out exactly how to bring the water down and the right pressure so that the fountains would play. And they played there for a thousand years. It is extraordinary. They were an enormous empire and left us Many, many cultural bequests that none of us seem to realize. And then, of course, you had Bonaparte and the French Empire, which was an enormous change. This peaked in 1812, and there are many resonances of it in Britain and in France to this day. And then an empire that we never hear about in school, the Ottoman Empire. We don't like to admit that the Turks ruled, but indeed they did. Throughout the 17th century, they became great and they spread their influence around the Mediterranean. And the Ottoman Empire lasted right through the First World War. It didn't shut down until 1922. To this day, there are resonances of that. I remember being taken once by a distinguished writer to a Turkish restaurant in the West End of London. And uh, the flamboyant waiter came across. 
and said, would he like some hummus or some taramasalata? And he looked him straight in the face and said, oh, I love Greek food. I've never seen anybody get smaller portions of anything in a West End restaurant. And then, of course, after World War II, we were left looking back at how the German Reich had spread. And that was the empire of Germany, of Nazi Germany. And the latest empire that we have is that of the unelected European Commission in Brussels, bless their little hearts. And yet still, there are quirks and oddities in modern Europe. I mean, for example, do you see up in the corner there? That's Kaliningrad. That is actually Russia. It's not connected to Russia, geographically. It's Russia. And down there we have Switzerland. Not connected to the EU. It has relationships with the EU, but it's not part of the European Union. And you still have these little oddities. And it's so useful to bear those in mind when you travel to the Med. And we did. We travelled to the Med. I first came down in 1967, when many of your parents hadn't even met. And, and Jan and I would bring the kids down. And, of course, in those days, everything was different. In those days, the captain, if he spotted you on board, might invite you up to the flight deck. And you could look out of the captain's cockpit and look across... The Alps, as we flew down, that's Mont Blanc in the middle. With these aircraft, you didn't so much fly over the Alps as through them. You could see the people on the ground. Absolutely extraordinary. And you'd jump in a coach and travel along to the Mediterranean coast and to see the resorts. You have chosen so wisely to come on this cruise at this time. In the summer, it's like hell on earth. Don't ever think of going to the Met. Promise me, you will never dream of going in July and August. It is appalling. Temperatures way over 100, people nudging against each other. But if you go in September, or I think this was in February, and it's beautiful spring-like weather, there aren't any tourists. Of course, the kids are all grown up now and have kids of their own. But we used to love to take the children out and explore the Med. It is in so many ways the cradle of Western civilization. There are so many relics, so many residences, and so many ways of actually getting a grasp on our past. And you will see the resonances of Arabia wherever you go. You will see, for example, people buy a pizza, and they argue in America as to whether it came from New York or Chicago. In Italy, they'll tell you it came from Naples. No, it's an Arabic flatbread. The Cornish pasty, which the Cornish will claim, is a folded flat. No, it's, it's an empanada. An empanada, you find them all over Arabia. It is quite remarkable. You'll see so many resonances. You may use Worcester sauce. The ancient Romans made a sauce from fermented fish called garum. And if you look at the ingredients of Worcestershire sauce, it's fermented fish. That's 2,000 years of history which we sprinkle on our food and don't give it a thought. Here we are in Menorca. That's Mahon, where we've just been. What a pretty little place. This is Citadelia, the old capital here in Menorca. So attractive. And we used to take the kids around the Balearic Islands when they were little. And the memories they had. In those days, you could take children out of British schools for two weeks on a prearranged family holiday, out of term time with no trouble. Do it now and they'll fine you. There's a conviction you've got to lock kids up in school and they bloody well got to say these children would come with us and explore. They would learn far more in two weeks exploring the Med than they would ever have learned in school. We went to Bulgaria once when Lee was, how old was he, Jenny? Six, seven? And he started reading Cyrillic. By the time he got home, he could read the signs in Cyrillic better than he could read them in English just because he was there immersed in the culture and taking the kids to the med out of season shoulder season gave them a chance to live a life that's different to the life that we have at home tomorrow we're going to go to Seta just look at it isn't that a pretty little place they have their own dialect their own traditions their own cultural identity they don't really regard themselves as actually French any more than Texans regard themselves as actually North Americans we're going to Toulon. 
Just look at that. It's a naval base, famous for winemaking. But the port side is just wonderful. They make a lot of electronic equipment. Then Saint-Tropez. We have family who live there. Saint-Tropez, it was murderous. We actually went there in the summer about 30 years ago, and we went there a couple of years ago. It was absolutely terrifying. Ghastly, awful place. They actually chased, a, a waiter chased an American tourist down the street who tipped 500 euros and said, you're very rich, you can tip more than that. I tell you, the queues around the block for the lavatories, the queues for horrible cheap ice cream, no, go out of season and then you'll see it as it really is. It's a pretty little place. We're going to go to Corsica. Corsica was under the Genoan Republic from Italy. Then it was ruled by Spain. Then it's been French since the 1700s. They have their own language. They seek independence. Oh yes, you're going to enjoy the fabulous sights that we see. And when you get to Rome, try and see the Pantheon. The Pantheon has got this wonderful portico on the front, but forget that, that was stuck there to make it look modern. It's a circular brick building. The biggest brick building ever built 2,000 years ago. Pantheon, pan, everything, theos, God. It was a temple for all the gods. A pagan temple. And it still is a pagan temple. When you go in, you'll see in the alcoves, nice little Catholic shrines built out of polished marble. And they'll tell you what a wonderful cathedral it is. But look past that. It's a pagan temple from ancient Rome. And it's standing to this day. We're going to end up in Rome, and my goodness, aren't you going to see some wonderful sights? Of course, this is the forum that we're looking at now, which reminds me very much of Pompeii. The forum has hardly changed. This is like walking around in a museum. You turn a corner and all you see are 2,000-year-old relics standing to this day. And the arch of Titus. Rome is such a romantic place. Well, we've had the most fantastic views of the, from the Palatine, looking at the uh, Colosseum and the Forum. Absolutely splendid. And now we're in the Colosseum, looking around anyway. <laughs> it really is unspeakably vast. It is actually the biggest Colosseum they ever built, but there are other very big ones. I remember the very memorable example that they got in Tunisia, which I saw in the 60s, which is one metre smaller than the Colosseum in Rome. I say memorable, the building itself is, though the name, unfortunately, isn't. Brian was telling me about he stayed at a restaurant, a restaurant, a hotel, overlooking the Colosseum when he was giving a lecture many years ago. But what I want to say is, we're sitting here in Italy by the Colosseum. We're going to have a pizza, Italian pizza. <laughs> and look at that for a glass of wine. Hey, now we're talking, baby. Ciao. Look at that. Coppa, coppa, margarita. Oh, and the olive oil. And I may say, most of you may not know why a margarita pizza is so called. When Princess Margarita visited the New Italy and was given all these grand dishes and wonderful food, and she said, what do the peasant people eat? And that's what I'd like to see. So a chap threw together a flatbread with some cheese, some tomatoes, and a little bit of of basil, basil. It must have the basil. If it doesn't, it's not a proper margarita. Because, of course, that was the colour of the new flag of the new state of Italy. The tomatoes were the red, the cheese was the white, and the basil was the green. She loved it, and ever since then, we've celebrated a pizza margarita without even realising where it came from. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen, from the Big Bang, which may not even have happened, to the present day, and a little bit of culture thrown in. Enjoy this cruise. It is the perfect itinerary at the ideal time of year. And when you get to Rome, be a Roman. <laughs>
immerse yourself in it and have a wonderful, unforgettable time. Thank you. Thank you very much.